Oryx was dividing the spawn. He cut apart the larvae with his sword, Willbreaker. The two divided pieces would not die, but grew. Powerful twins that ascended to wizards. Ihalak and Ionuk, the Death Singers. Welcome back, Guardians. Today we are discussing the lore surrounding the daughters of Oryx, Ihalak and Ironuk, the Death Singers. I'll discuss why Oryx decided to have sons and daughters, how the Death Singers were created, how the Death Singers helped to create some of the most powerful hive weaponry, including weapons wielded by Guardians, the main purpose of the Death Singers, and also the raid mechanics seen in the King's Fall raid. At the end of the video, I have some new artwork for you titled Drowned in Blood. The artwork is available for download on my Patreon page. The link is in the description. You can skip to any section in today's video by clicking the annotations on screen or by manually selecting the time as indicated on screen. Lastly, if you speak Spanish and are interested in Destiny Law, I have left a link to a Spanish Destiny Law channel also in the description. This is Marlin Games, and I hope you enjoyed this latest Destiny Law episode. Let's begin with why Oryx decided to have sons and daughters. In the Book of Sorrows, verse 3.8, King of Shapes, Oryx kills the worm god Aka, cutting him into pieces with a sword. From this, he discovered the secret to calling upon the deep. He wrote those secrets on a set of tablets, which became the Tablets of Ruin. The Tablets of Ruin allowed Oryx to navigate the deep and commune directly with the deep. Whilst it is not confirmed, this area where Oryx speaks with the deep appears to be another dimension, separate from his throne world. This area is where Oryx learns the power to take and becomes Oryx, the Taken King. So why would someone as powerful as Oryx need sons and daughters? When Oryx communes with the Deep, he has to leave his throne world, and this leaves him vulnerable to sabotage, specifically from his sisters, Snavathan and Zyphri Arath. Oryx suspects that when he is absent from his throne world, Snavathan and Zyphri Arath try to disrupt his lines of tribute, as well as steal the Tablets of Ruin. This is reinforced in verse 4.4, More Beautiful to Know, where Oryx says, I think that Savathun and Zyphu Arath are trying to steal the tablets from me. They must have cut off my tribute while I was away communing with the deep. I love them so dearly. No one else is clever or strong enough to try to break me. No one else can give me this gift. You will know that if Savathun and Zyphi Arath are successful in crippling Oryx's system of tribute, it would be catastrophic for Oryx. The system of tribute is extremely important to any Ascendant Hive because this is what allows them to feed the growing hunger of their worms. The system works by having lesser hive, like thralls, tithe energy from killing to more superior hive, like Acolytes, who then tithe energy to even more superior hive like knights, and so on and so forth, until the tithing is delivered to Oryx himself, allowing him to feed his worm. If this system was not in place, Oryx could not kill enough beings to feed his worm, and consequently his worm would destroy him. In addition, apart from just quenching the hunger of Oryx's worm, the system of tribute frees up valuable time so that Oryx can follow his nature, which is to navigate and explore. If he had to spend his entire time killing in order to feed his worm, he would not have enough time to navigate and explore. Not only did Savathun and Zyphi Arath try to cripple Oryx's system of tribute, which would destroy him, they also plan to strand Oryx in another dimension. This is reinforced by verse 4.5, This love is war, which reads, Betrayal. We have marooned Oryx within the deep. This is our obligation as lords of the hive, to make war upon each other, to eradicate weakness and make ourselves sharp. This is why Oryx decided to have sons and daughters. He needed a family to protect his lines of tribute, to protect his throne world, 
whilst he was absent, whilst he was navigating and exploring. This is reinforced by verse 4.4, more beautiful you know, which says, When I get home from my wanderings in the deep, and I take back my throne, I'm going to have children, that's what I need. The idea that Oryx needed sons and daughters to secure his lines of tribute is further detailed in the description of Crota's birth in verse 4.6, Eater of Hope, which reads, You are Crota, my son, welcome. I fought my way out of hell to make you. I fought my traitor siblings, I fought the swarming corpse of Akka, and I cut my way back into my own court, the High War, which had been unsurped. Once I had made war on Savathun and crippled her tribute so that she could never challenge me, and once I had tricked Zyphi Arath and poisoned her tribute so that she could never again try to take my tablets, and once I had ranged my own lineages so that I would be greatest among the hive and secure on my throne, then I found a mother to make spawn. One of those spawn was you. This verse also has the very first and only mention of Oryx's mate, who remains unnamed. However, the important aspect here is that Oryx had multiple spawn, as it says, one of those spawn was you. And so I believe that Oryx has more children, even more than just Crota and the Death Singers. The reason why we do not hear of any other spawn is because they have not ascended. The spawn of Oryx are not automatically given a position amongst the Ascendant Hive, they have to earn it. This is reinforced by verse 4.6, Eater of Hope, where Oryx says this to Crota. Your life will be a battle too. You will have to win your place at the High War. I will give you nothing, except this. Your first sword and this name I have prepared for you. Furthermore, all Hive are born the same. They are not born as Nines or Wizards or Ogres. Every Hive starts as a Thrall and must ascend to a greater being. This is reinforced by verse 3.0, Hive, which reads, A mother wizard gets fertility from a mate, or from herself. From the wizard the spawn, from the spawn our thrall, from the survivors our acolytes who contend. If they contend well, their worm is fed, and from the well-fed worm come knights and wizards and princes. Also remember that this ascension, this evolution from Thrall, is quite difficult because Oryx introduced the system of tribute, and they now have to tithe energy to the superior hive, and so that only the strongest and most lethal hive could kill enough to ascend. So Oryx has decided to have a family to protect his tribute and tablets of ruin. He finds a mother, Crota is born, amongst other spawn, and then the Death Singers are created. We are unsure whether their creation is by pure chance or whether it was intentional. The Grimoire card for Iahalak reads, Oryx was dividing the spawn. He cut apart the larvae with his sword, and the two divided pieces grew into twins. Verse 4.7 Shapes and Points also reads, I made you by cutting one larvae in half. It would not die. Each half grew into one of you. My sword is named Willbreaker, but it never broke you. Ihalak and Iranuk were created by being cleaved in half by Willbreaker, Oryx's sword, and they didn't die. This foreshadows the immense power of the Death Singers, even as a larvae, they were resilient to death. But why was Oryx cutting his larvae in half? Was this intentional or a mistake? There are a couple of potential speculative reasons behind this. Firstly, it says, Oryx was dividing the spawn. This gives me the impression that Oryx was splitting the spawn into different groups. Maybe he was separating any larvae that appeared weak or deformed from the healthy and strong larvae. I can also imagine that if Oryx was sorting his children, he would not be gentle and caring, but rather careless, and in a high fashion he would push them aside, dividing them into two groups, using a sword, using Willbreaker. If this was the case, and he was sorting the spawn using his sword, maybe he accidentally cut one of the larvae in half, and to his surprise, it did not die. 
Alternatively, maybe Oryx was killing his spawn on purpose, and this would not be the first time that he had cut his children apart. In verse 2.6, the sword logic, Oryx learns sword logic from the hive gods and is asked to kill his children with a long blade, and watch how the blade changes. It reads, You are no longer bound by causal closure. Your will defeats law. Kill a hundred of your children with a long blade, Oryx, and observe the change in the blade. Observe how the universe shrinks from you in terror. Verse 4.4, more beautiful you know, also says that Oryx wanted children to love and kill. So maybe he was intentionally killing his spawn to either feed his own worm, to strengthen his sword willbreaker, which was the method taught to him by the worm gods, or maybe Oryx was trying to see if any other larvae would actually survive a cut from willbreaker. Any larvae that could survive would prove that it's worth and it is part of the final universe and surely develop into a powerful hive force. I just keep imagining a 300 Spartan vibe where any weak children would be killed and the strong would even be tested at a young age to truly form a formidable army. Regardless to why Oryx was cutting apart his larvae, the surviving pieces grew into Ihalak and Ir Anuk. Whilst the wizard death singers are twins, literally cut from the same larvae, verse 4.7 shapes points, emphasizes that the death singers have quite separate traits and strengths. It even appears that the Death Singers were raised by Oryx's sisters, Savathun and Xiphi Arath. This is reinforced in verse 4.7, where it appears Oryx has not seen his daughters in a very long time. Oryx says, Look at you, already you are grown, my daughter, already you are a wizard. Have I been away so long? The idea that Death Singers were raised by Savathun and Xiphi Arath may further reinforce Oryx's plan to secure his lines of tribute, as the Death Singers could closely monitor Savathun and Xiphi Arath, ensuring that they did not betray Oryx. Iranuk the Weaver appears to have been raised more by Savathun, and consequently, out of the two Death Singers, Iranuk has more knowledge and cunningness. This is reinforced by verse 4.7, Shapes Points, which reads, Already you are grown, my daughter. Already you are a wizard. Have I been away so long? Now you are Ir Anuk, and Savathun cackles and rages at your brilliance. You have written eleven axioms, describing the ascendant places, our throne world. You have announced that you will kill one of these axioms, as Akka would kill the truth, and in mantling Akka, you will become a god as I am. Ianuk has written axioms. An axiom is a statement or proposition which is regarded as being established, accepted, or self-evidently true. It is like the accepted truth about something. So in this case, Ianuk has discovered the truths about the ascendant plane, the throne worlds. I sort of consider this like the laws of the realm, the laws of the ascendant plane, and Ianuk has documented them. And this verse says. Savathun cackles and rages at her brilliance. Ihalak the Unraveler, on the other hand, appears to be raised by Zaifu Arath. Zaifu Arath's nature is to wage war on everything, so consequently Ihalak is more combat focused than Iranuk. Verse 4.7 shapes points, hints that Ihalak was the specific sister to create the Death Singer song. It reads, And you, Ihalak, you are a wizard too. As is the way of twins, I have been with Zaifu Arath, who complains that you have made a song, and sung it in her throne world, and killed everyone who listened, quite irrevocably. Will we have songs instead of swords and boomers? What have you made for me? It is a tooth shaped like death. I will keep it in my mouth. What have you written for me? It is the course of the Nietzsche thought ship. I will track it down. Let's continue. The Death Singers are now very powerful wizards, powers that almost match, if not exceed, Savathun and Zaphi Arath. The Death Singers created very powerful hive weaponry, including the Death Singers Song, the Oversoul, the Annihilator Totems, and the super weapon aboard the Dreadnought. 
As previously mentioned, one of the first weapons created was the Death Singer's Song, created by Ear Haluk. We first encountered the Death Singer's Song in the Crota's End Raid, where Ear Yut, another Death Singer, sings a song which wipes the entire fire team if we do not intervene. I assume that Ear Haluk passed the knowledge of the Death Singer's Song to other powerful wizards such as Ear Yut. In the Ear Yut Death Singer Grimoire card, Tolan reveals that the song is death, and to simply hear it is to die. The death song does not discriminate between ally or enemy, and Ealuk actually sang the song in Zyphi Aris Throne World, and every hive who heard the song died irrevocably. Oryx himself even questions the power of the Death Singer song, saying that it could even replace the hive swords and boomers. However, the most obvious conundrum is how did the Death Singers sing the song and not die themselves? Tolan poses this question to Ariana 3 in the Eeyut Death Singer Grimoire card. The answer to this question appears to be the Oversoul, and likely the brands of the Unraveler and the brand of the Weaver, which we will see in the King's Fall raid and I'll speak about later on. The creation of the Oversoul was introduced in the Book of Sorrows, verse 4.8, Petition of Death. Oryx discovers the sisters in a wound between dimensions dying, and they explain that they are trying to create an Oversoul. An Oversoul involves removing their soul and placing it in the throne world, making the Death Singers more difficult to kill and allows them to refine the Death Singer song. The verse reads, we propose a method by which ascendant souls can be detached and integrated into a tautological and autonomous thanatosphere, which we tentatively term an oversoul. Oversouls can be stored in a throne world as a mechanism of enhanced death resilience. As a side effect, new refinements to our death song may be achieved, moving us closer to a generally effective paracausal death impulse. It appears that the cunningness and brilliance of the sisters even surprise Oryx, so Oryx demands that they speak in layman terms. He says, Speak the royal tongue, I'll pin you up for ear to eat. The Death Singers respond, If we can separate our deaths from ourselves and hide them, we will be hard to kill. Oryx then tells Crota to spend some time with his sisters as they have much to teach him. At this point, Crota also tries to be clever and accidentally creates a portal that allows the Vex to enter Oryx's throne world, and this is the first documentation of the Vex. However, before Crota royally screwed up, I assume he also learned how to make an Oversoul from his sisters, because we see an Oversoul in the Crota's End Raid. The other place we see an Oversoul is the War Priest boss room in the King's Fall Raid upon the Dreadnought. Even though it is referred to as an Oculus in-game, the developers have referred to it as an Oversoul during the raid livestream. I've made a separate video about the War Priest which covers this in greater detail. Interestingly, the Daughters of Oryx may not have been the first wizards to experiment with this idea of detaching your soul to make you harder to kill. The three wizards we see in the Court of Oryx may have tried a similar strategy first. They hid their souls in each other, so that the only way to kill them was to kill all three of them very quickly. The Alzok Dal, Gornuk Dal, and Zyrok Dal card reads, First, before my daughters, I saw Alzok lead her sisters through the eye, saying death will be our coven, with black fire and grey blade. Gornuk consecrated their singing, they cut their deaths away. To Zyrok I said, show me the place where you have hidden your death. I am Oryx, your lord. Oryx, my lord, she said. We have hidden our deaths in each other, so that we will never be alone. Arguably, the Death Singers improved on this idea and created the Oversoul. From there, they would go on to create the Annihilated Totems. The reason why the Death Singers created the Annihilated Totems was to destroy the Vex. As I previously mentioned, Crota accidentally let the Vex into Oryx's throne world, and the Vex actually started to take over, as one of the Vex minds, Korea Blade Transform, deduced the sword logic and became very powerful in the throne world. In fact, they fought in the throne world for a hundred years. Verse 4.9, Open Your Eye, Go Into It, reads, The Vex clattered around, constructing large problems. At first their constructions were deranged, because they didn't understand the sword logic, which defined all rules in Oryx's throne world. The geometry perplexed them. I'll cut them apart, Crota said. 
But just then, the Vex ritual of better thoughts manifested a mind called Korea Blade Transform. Korea deduced the sword logic. I have to kill everything Korea resolved, then I'll be powerful. Korea's gate began to emit a warrior Vex, huge and brassy. He leapt forward to fight them, but they blinked away. After they fled from Crota, they killed 2,000 of Oryx's acolytes and 10,000 of his thrall. Soon they had established themselves as powers in this world by right of slaughter. Come forth, sister wizards, called Ihalak. We need you. Irinuk pulled the sword star out of the sky. Together the wizards charged it with killing power and made an annihilated totem, which they used to smash the Vex. There are a couple of interesting aspects to the creation of the annihilated totems. Firstly, it was made by multiple wizards. The Death Singers actually called upon other wizards to charge it with death. The second interesting thing is that Ianuk pulled a sword star out of the sky. As far as I know, this is the only reference to a sword star in the Grimmel cards. However, a subscriber made a very interesting comment during my live stream that the sword star could potentially be aligned with the light. As Iranuk pulled it from the sky, remembering that the sky also refers to the cosmic force that is opposite of the deep. The sky is the light and the deep is the darkness. So did the sisters use a weapon of the light and transform it into the annihilated totems? We're not really sure, however interestingly the annihilated totems are deactivated when a guardian stands directly beneath them. So maybe there is a connection with the creation of the totems and the light. Regardless, the Annihilated Totems were essential in controlling the Vex in Oryx's throne world, and eventually once Oryx was alerted to the Vex invading his world, Oryx defeated the Vex using the power of the Deep and by taking them. The Death Singers have created the Death Singers Song, the Oversoul, the Annihilated Totems, and would then go on to create another Hive weapon, the super weapon aboard the Dreadnought. That is the weapon we see at the beginning of the Taken King which obliterates the Awoken and the Queen. Verse 4.11, Dreadnought, confirms that the super weapon is a creation of the Death Singers. It reads, Flotilla surrounded his Dreadnought. Oryx put his sword into the hull, and he used the power of the deep and the clever systems his daughters built to push his throne world out into mere reality. By wrath and confidence, he filled space with an egg of his throne. It swelled up like a ghost star to smash the harmonious Flotilla Invincible. Oryx broke the last word off their name. This verse also provides greater clarity to what the weapon actually is, and it appears that the weapon causes a collision of Oryx's throne world with our own reality. Oryx's Dreadnought is a tricky thing to understand, and verse 4.11 Dreadnought says that it was created by pushing his throne world inside out, and that the Dreadnought was within the throne of Oryx, but the throne of Oryx was the Dreadnought. Regardless of our understanding of the Dreadnought, it appears that the super weapon smashes these two dimensions together, creating a destructive wave. Or that just by pushing Oryx's throne world into our reality, it destroys everything in its path. Remember the Queen is not dead, which was told during one of the live streams, and considering this weapon collides dimensions together, it is completely plausible that the Queen understood this and with the assistance of her carbon rather than being destroyed, transitioned into the Hive Netherworld to meet up with Toland. In summary, the Death Singers created immensely powerful weapons. The Death Singers Song, the Oversoul, the Annihilated Totems and the Super Weapon aboard the Dreadnought. Not only that, but I also believe that they influence certain weapons that Guardians use. Specifically, Touch of Malice, Black Spindle and Bad Juju. To create Touch of Malice, you need the Shroud of Eon Nook, amongst the other relics, Blade of Famine and the Ravenous Heart. The form the ritual quest line reads, Board the Dreadnought and recover the Blade of Famine, the Shroud of Eon Nook and the Ravenous Heart. The Famine, the Feeding, and always the Death Singer's Shroud covers all. These are the keys, these are the keys. Toland's Journal. Whilst this is very cryptic, like anything from Toland's Journal, the Death Singer Ia Anuk is essential to creating the Touch of Malice. Another weapon, the Black Spindle, directly references the Death Singers and says, Your only existence shall be that which I weave for you out of sorrow and woe. Sing death songs, 
fatal final absolute. Ihalak and Iranuk laugh at Crota. Finality is a child's plaything, fit for one such thing as Crota. They say, no hammer for the unraveller and the weaver, but a spindle, wound with woe, for their foes no end of suffering. The bad juju also has a loose connection to the Death Singers, because its design was created by Toland. If you remember back to Eris's Mons fire team, who initially tried to take down Crota and failed, you'll remember that Tolan was part of that team and had some questionable intentions, as he appeared to only be interested in learning the Death Singer's song. The Ear Yut, the Death Singer Grimmel card reads, Ariana, let's sing, sing with me. No, no, you rattling machine. Not yet, it's too soon. We don't know the words. We'll learn the song down there. We can learn it from her. She comes up from the deep dark places where the greater hive await to sing it to us. And here's the puzzle for you. The song is death. To hear it is to die. To know the words is mortal. Oh, good point, Ariana. Death is just a word, isn't it? A catch-all term for the failure to go on. Nothing spiritual, nothing with its own quiddity. We all died once, and it did not prove insurmountable. But what if, what if, what if, listen, what if death were refired, described in its totality, made autonomous and universal, separate from any context or condition? What if she could evoke the ending of anything? How then would she know the song and sing it without herself dying? Perhaps they know a way to make themselves part of the song, part of something vast and burning that rots and peel into ash, but never ends. Perhaps she has engineered this for him and pinned his power up against the quiddity of death itself. I am so terribly curious to know. Turns out that with the release of the Taken King, Tolan did meet the death singer Eyjord, and from this meeting transitioned into the hive near the world. The ghost fragment, the Hellmouth, reads. I too am detached from my source. The charming Iyut made her introductions, and I was very pleased to meet her. We had a conversation, a little tete yurt, a couple of old wizards exchanging definitions. I defined myself a friend. She defined me the quiddity of death. She sang the song of that fearful autonomy. Revelation, my friends, it does go down hard. The definition killed me. The killing redefined me. This is the shape and the point of the tooth. Nothing has ever lived that will not die. Now I fly between green black suns in the labyrinth beyond Crota's god star. This is the overworld, the sea of screams, with the throne universes of the great high fester in eternal majesty. I move among them. I map the shapes and connections of this world. Even though Toland only had contact with Iyut the Death Singer. Rather than the sisters, I believe that some of this hive knowledge was reflected in Bad Juju. Bad Juju, Black Spindle, and the Touch of Malice all have a similar mechanic, and that is that the bullets return to the magazine. Returning bullets to the magazine in these hive weaponry might be a design or might have some influence from the Death Singers, considering that they can weave and unweave reality. So far we have spoken about why Oryx decided to have children, the creation and growth of the Death Singers, and the weapons they created. Now let's look at their main purpose. The purpose of the Death Singers was actually revealed in the live stream by Jill Shah who said, One of the tasks the daughters have is to unravel our world and reweave, expand Oryx's realm. They are literally taking over on a metaphysical level. This is also confirmed in both the Ianuk and Ihalak Grimmel card. Ihalak reads, She who stands ahead at the prow of the ship of Oryx, her father, she is Ihalak the Unraveler. She plies her blades upon the fabric of space, cuts the seams, pulls apart the cloth, leaves worlds in tatters. Ianuk reads, Behind the Unraveler comes Ianuk the Weaver, she takes in hand the threads of her sister's work, weaves them into the tapestry of Oryx's realm. With this knowledge, this gives explanation to why the Death Singers are at the head of the Dreadnought. They are unraveling reality as they move through space, and they are weaving into it Oryx's throne world. In addition to this, their purpose is like all other Hive faithful to Oryx, and that is to tithe energy to Oryx in order to feed his worm. This is confirmed in verse 5.8 of the Book of Sorrows, where Oryx says, 
Lately, I have realized how much I depend on Crota and my daughters, and even my court. If I lost them, my outlays would exceed my intakes. My tribute would not be enough to feed my worm. But this is proper. For if I lost them, it would be because they were not mighty enough, and then I would be a bad father, a bad king. I must test them and fight with them to keep them strong. This is my Gears. Now that we understand the backstory of the Death Singers and their purpose, we can better understand the mechanics of the King's Fall raid. As you enter the room, Ihalak the Unraveler is on the right hand side, and Iranuk the Weaver is on the left hand side. They are surrounded by brands. Ihalak the Unraveler has the brand of the Weaver. Iarnuk the Weaver has the brand of the Unraveler. We steal these brands to protect our fire team from the songs of the Death Singers. We get an object called the Brand Claimer from platforming when a guardian is torn between dimensions. This allows us to steal the brands from the sisters. From a lore point of view, we don't really know why we have to go between dimensions to grab this relic. However, similarly to how the Death Singers hid their ascendant soul in another dimension, they too may have been hiding the Brand Claimer in another dimension to make it more difficult for anyone trying to defeat them. We cannot just claim any brand and be protected from the Death Singer's song. If the Hymn of Weaving is active, we need to steal the brand of the Unraveler from Ia Anuk. If the Dirge of Unraveling is playing, we need to steal the brand of the Weaver from Ia Halak. If we do not have the correct brand or aura protection when the song finishes, we will be instantly killed. For protection from the songs, we need the opposite. If weaving is playing, we need unraveling. If unraveling is playing, we need weaving. I can only assume that the act of simultaneously weaving and unraveling allows guardians to continue to exist. As I mentioned before, the Oversoul may have been used by the Death Singers so that they would not die when practicing the Death Song. However, the raid mechanic implies that they would later invent brands and auras to also protect them from the Death Song. I speculate that maybe this was developed by the Death Singers to protect Oryx's own forces from the Death Songs. The songs could be used in battle and it would not kill the Hive because they would be protected by the appropriate brands and auras. However, the Hive in the room are not wiped by the songs anyway, so maybe there is another explanation for this. I also thought the brands protected each Death Singer from each other, so that they could practice the Death Song. However, this theory is also flawed because technically you steal the brand from one sister to protect yourself. So that sister that no longer has the brand should be killed by the death song, regardless about how much damage you do to her as a fight team. It is at this point that I became completely obsessed with trying to better explain the raid mechanics, specifically focusing on which exact sister is singing the hymn of weaving and which sister is singing the dirge of unraveling. You may think this is easy. When the Hymn of Weaving is playing Ihalak, the Unraveler is glowing red, and Ihanuk the Weaver is doing nothing. So Ihalak the Unraveler must be singing, which means that the Death Singers sing the opposite song. The Unraveler sings the Hymn of Weaving, and the Weaver sings the Dirge of Unraveling. But there is one piece of evidence that completely ruins this theory. If you die to the Hymn of Weaving, the Death Screen says that you were killed by Ihanuk using the Hymn of Weaving, not Ihalak. If this is true, this means the Death Singer doing it nothing is actually the one singing, not the one that looks like they are casting a song. However, this theory also becomes impossible because when you only have one Death Singer left, a hymn of weaving is playing, and the remaining Death Singer is glowing red. So, unfortunately, I do not have any solid conclusions from the raid mechanics, and if you feel like you have an answer, please leave it in the comments. You stand victorious on the prow of the Dreadnought and think yourself clever. But did you honestly think the Death Singers could be defeated so easily? Did you destroy their Oversoul? Well, did you? No? Well, why are you so confident they have been destroyed? We destroyed the Death Singer Iyut in Crota's End Raid. Were you so blind that you did not notice her return in the last rites? 
Death is just a word, isn't it? Thank you for listening, everyone. That is all the information I could pull about the Death Singers and the law surrounding the Death Singers in the King's Fall Raid. Let's now move on to the artwork for this week. It is titled Drowned in Blood and draws inspiration from the War Priest encounter. We have to prove our worth through bloodshed. I hope you enjoy the art. If you have made it to the end, <laughs> I know it has been an extremely long video, please let me know by leaving the comment Spawn Divider to acknowledge speculation that Oryx was carelessly separating his lava into groups using a sword. <laughs> which resulted in accidentally cutting the larvae in half, which resulted in creating the Death Singers. Once again, it has been a pleasure. In fact, this video has even been a little bit exhausting. <laughs> this is Marlin Games. Peace.